today we are continuing with our testify series. Um, I have asked and am absolutely shocked and amazed that she answered yes. Um, I've asked Imelda if she would come up and share her testimony with us. And, and she already got to practice on the youth group on Wednesday. I have not even asked any of the people that were there Wednesday what she said. So I want to be shocked and amazed. <laughs> so Imelda, if you would go ahead and come up. I'm just going to read so you guys can understand what I'm saying. So, um, <coughs> so, hello, for those who do not know me very well, my name is Imelda McDaniel. I was born in Tepic, Nayarit, Mexico, into a large family with 10 brothers and sisters. My family was very poor when I was growing up. I remember the house being made of sturdy cardboard with dirt floor. We ate mostly beans and rice. It was a very abusive environment. My stepdad was an alcoholic, so there was a lot of domestic violence. When I was about seven years old, I was kidnapped. Thanks to be to God, I was in her account. The kidnapper left me in a field where a couple found me crying and took me to their home and fed me and called the police who returned me to my mom. About three months later, being unable to support all of us, my mom took my older brother and I to a Christian orphanage it was called Casa de Niños. That was the last time I saw my mom for many, many years. At the age of nine, I accept Jesus Christ into my heart. That was a new experience for me to finally feel love unconditionally. A few years later, when I was 12, I was in a cooking accident involving a gas stove where my face was bit, um, badly burned. I had to stay inside out of the sun for three months. And I And I remember praying with my friend that I would have that I wouldn't have scars on my face. As you can see, God was there again to protect me. As I got older, I became involved in youth group and worship. And for a while, I traveled with music ministry. When I was 18, I remember talking to my friend and telling them that I never wanted to be married to a pastor or a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny to see now that God had a very different plan for my life. At the age of 20, I met my wonderful husband, Kevin. We were married a year later, and it has been 14 wonderful years. I'm thankful for our two wonderful daughters that God has given us, and I'm thankful for God for everything he has done in my life, and for everything he has put me through because he has made me who I am today. And I just want to end by saying that I'm scared, but at the same time, I'm excited what God has next for me and my family. Thank you. And I'm going to have Kevin read one of my favorite verses. Um, Isaiah chapter 41, verses 9 and 10. It reads, I took you from the end of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Thank you. I ask 
asked Imelda a couple of weeks ago, they came over to our house and were sharing with us the burden that God had put on their heart to be missionaries. And I asked Imelda if she would be willing to share her testimony in church. Wow, were the crickets loud. <laughs> And she stared at me, and I started getting uncomfortable. <laughs> kind of got a little awkward. I asked Christy, how do we get out of this? <laughs> and um, I asked her if she would pray about it. Now, you know, Amelda's been in this church for seven, eight years now. Most of you know. Especially in front of people. And when Kevin sent me a message, said, uh, Imelda would like to give her testimony on Sunday. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, actually, I was, I was dumbfounded when I read his, his email. So moved on Christy that she actually started to cry. That Imelda is taking this step. You talk about stepping outside your comfort zone and getting up and sharing with us what God has done in her life. And I loved that statement. For the first time in my life, I knew what it was like to be loved unconditionally. Right at that time, I loved that. I loved that. I mean, if that isn't how you feel in your relationship with God, you're messed up. There's something wrong. There's something off. Because that's what it's all about. Absolute, unconditional love based on who he is, not on who you are. Not on anything that you've done. Simply based on who he is. That's his nature. Thank you, Imelda, for sharing that. We are in our essentials, the essentials of our faith. And we have covered a few of them. We started off with the inerrancy of God's Word. And I qualified that saying the inerrancy of God's Word in the original language. God chose Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic for a reason. He didn't confide in me those reasons. But he did not choose English either to write his original documents in, the original manuscripts. And so I, I know sometimes people get really hung up on, well, his Bible reads this way and hers reads that way. Yeah, what about it? Well, if it's God's Word, shouldn't they all read the same? Okay, if you and I watch the same accident, and the police come and they get my report and they get your report. We're describing the same accident, but we're describing it from two different viewpoints, aren't we? Is one of us lying? No. Is there an error in our testimony? No. The English is a poor, poor language to communicate in. English is horrible. English is a hodgepodge. It's made up of multiple languages that don't even like each other. <laughs> we got words from German and French and Latin and Greek. It's no wonder we don't understand ourselves. <laughs> Much less any other country in the world, man. They're like, oh, please, not English. <laughs> we talked about the inerrancy of God's word. We started there because we have to understand this is essential for us to understand everything else because that's how God has chosen to reveal himself to us. That is the primary way that God reveals himself to us. We have to trust his word. Okay? So we started there. Then we talked about the nature of God. We talked about monotheism. One God. One. There has only ever been and will only ever be one God. We then talked about the triune nature of God. That that one God has always existed and will always exist in three parts. And we went back and we looked at 
the, the original languages, and we saw how God revealed himself in the Old Testament, even in the Shema, where God reveals himself, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He reveals it in such a way that it is a plurality. Now we go, one, one can't be three. Yeah, it's God. That's why he's God and you're not. Okay, because he can do that. We can't. And so we talked about the triune nature of God. We talked about the Father. We talked about the Son. We talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about the virgin birth. Why is that necessary to believe the virgin birth? Because you have to understand that the person that went to the cross was not like you and me. Okay? He was different in that he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Okay? He was not born with the sin nature that we have. He's different. Why is it necessary to believe? Because he's not like us. And we have to understand that from his birth. Okay? He lived a perfect sinless life. We, I, I can't even wrap my head around that. I really can't. Because it says, he was afflicted with every temptation known to man, and yet did not fall. I would like to go just half an hour. <laughs> because see, the, the whole thing is, uh, we were watching a video by Louis Giglio, and he was talking about how difficult it is to live, I mean, God gave us Ten Commandments. And how we can't even fulfill the Ten Commandments. And I was thinking, how silly is that? Because in the garden, he only gave them one. And they blew it. One command. Don't eat that fruit. That one, that one, that one. All the other ones are good. Don't eat that one. And they blew it. And yet, Jesus remained sinless. Tempted in every way and yet did not sin. Okay? We need to believe that because if we don't believe that, when he went to the cross, he didn't go perfect and pure. And then that sacrifice isn't what God's word says it is. Acceptable. Acceptable. Not just to cover over sin, but to do away with sin. See, we have to believe that. Because otherwise, we're stuck. And we can't get out of our sin. And we talked about his burial and resurrection. Why do we have to believe his resurrection? Why? Because it proves that what he said was going to happen at the cross really happened. It proves that when he told us that we would be raised again, we will be raised again. <coughs> See, there are certain things we have to believe. Now, there are other things, the non-essentials, that, boy, we get really foolish with the non-essentials. All of a sudden, they become so critically important to us. I can't fellowship with you. You listen to weird music. I, I, you know, I have a lot of friends in the IFCA, but I've only gone to one conference, and I was... Uh, Kelly warned me. <laughs> Kelly warned me. Um, Jesus Community Church was the most progressive church in the IFCA. Okay. How bad can it be? Well, it's not bad. I don't want to say bad. Let me, let me rephrase. How different can it be? Because I don't want to say bad because that makes it sound like they did something wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. They did it differently. I was, I was a little surprised when the music leader apologized for doing a new song. That was from the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> a new song. It was still in the hymnal. And, and so, I was also shocked that I knew every hymn that they sang, but one. There was one I didn't know. I actually had to look at the words. We're, we're different. We're, we're progressive. But you know what? I don't look down my nose at them because all they sing is hymns. I'm learning not to look down my nose at some of the other churches that sing weird songs that I don't, I, I just have a difficult time worshiping to. And actually God's teaching me in that because see, worship isn't based on the music that's playing up here. It's based on the music that's playing inside here. Amen. Amen. Okay. 
Now, I, I do have a preference. Christopher, I will not listen to your music. <laughs> I, I think it's even a stretch to call some of it music. <laughs> but that's my preference. I understand that. Because quite honestly, I have seen him and others that listen to that worship God to that music. And I'm going to step in and say he can't? No. See, that's a non-essential. But boy, do we get caught up in that, don't we? So today, we're, we're doing a two-part message today. And part of it we've already addressed. I'm not going to do both parts today. Don't panic. I'm, I'm only doing one part today. Okay? But it, it, you have to understand that it's the first part of two parts. Okay? Because if you walk away from te today not looking forward to the next part, it's ugly. It's ugly. Because we are now moving on to the nature of man. Yeah, yuck. Okay? So today we're going to deal with the nature of man. Well, that's problematic because we stink. I mean, you know, we stink like the boys' locker room in high school, or worse, okay? We stink. We're gonna talk about that, but I want you to understand we have to start there, or next, week message, next, next week's message will make no sense. It's of no value because next week we're going to talk about the redemption of man. Okay? And if you don't understand our nature, you will never comprehend our redemption. You have to be firmly fixed in your mind on where we are at to be able to appreciate what he has done. Okay? So, let's get into this. All right? Open to Genesis. Chapter 1. That's a good place to start, right? Genesis chapter 1. The beginning of things. difficult on the uh, pages. So in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we start off with, in the beginning. Uh, I need to address something real quick before we move on. Who's beginning? Ours. Ours, okay? The beginning of the things that we know. You need to understand it wasn't like, it's not talking about God. Okay, because it says, in the beginning, God. So, in the beginning, God was already there. So, it can't mean in the beginning, God created himself and then God got busy doing other things. Alright? So, you need to understand, when it says, in the beginning, God has no beginning. He's eternal. He has always been, will always be eternal. Okay? So, we, you have to start off with that understanding. Now, we're going to jump way ahead. In the beginning, God created everything. But we're going to jump way down. We're going to start in verse 26. So Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And, and it was so. And God saw everything he had made, 
And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. <clears throat> so the sixth day comes along. God says, well, we've made the water, we've made the firmament, we've separated the heavens, we've created, <coughs> excuse me, we've created the stars and put them in place, named all of them. We've created all the birds, we've created all the fish, we've created Leviathan, we've created, and he knows all of them. Christy, could you hand me my water, please? Sir? <coughs> Thank you. So everything has been made. The sixth day comes along and God says, not done yet. We've got one more thing to do. Let's create man. Now we're going to talk about this in just a second, okay? Up to this point, at the end of each day, what did God say? It is good. It's good. That's why I'm not God. Now, I'd have looked down and saw snakes and scorpions and spiders and things like that, and I'd have said, oops. <laughs> but God looked at it and said it was good. Now, keep in mind, this was pre-curse. I've only known those things under the curse, when things are broken. God said, let us make man. Now, he says something interesting here. First, let us make man. We talked about that in the Hebrew. The us there is plural, three or more. Okay? Now, we, we, we dealt with that. But he says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Now, I have to tell you, sometimes studying for my messages is really frustrating. Because there are three things that you're never supposed to talk about with people unless you know them really well. And then you talk about them cautiously. Okay? You don't talk about politics. You don't talk about religion and you don't ever talk about their wife. Okay? But, interestingly enough, if you get on the internet, what are you going to find on the internet people are talking about? Politics, religion, and somebody's wife. Don't believe me? Go look in the entertainment section of any newspaper. Alright? But, but when I'm doing my research, because I write my messages out, I write my messages first. Then I go out and I look, and I see what other men of God have said about the subject, because I don't want to limit myself to my own understanding. And, and I go, you know, I go from Calvin to Wesley. And Luther. I, I look everywhere. I want to hear what people have to say. I don't want to limit myself to my own understanding. Okay? And there are times when I go, wow, I have never even considered that. <clears throat> but this statement right here is one of those ones that I just, I finally put it down and I said, <laughs> let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. Do you know, we don't know what that means. <laughs> what does that mean? After our own image, in our own image, in our own likeness, what does that mean? Well, you guys better hope, there's only a couple of you out here that better hope I'm not in God's image because if I'm the only one in God's image and you guys got hair here, you're hosed. Okay? You're okay. You're okay. The rest of you guys are in trouble. Okay? It's not a physical thing that he's talking about, right? Because, well, I mean, God has two arms and two legs and a neck. Well, no, he's spirit. He doesn't have those things. So it can't be the image of the physical appearance of how man looks. But I'll tell you what, man, there are so many opinions about what this means and people speaking so authoritatively on it. And, and a lot of them, they spend more time talking about what it can't mean than what it does mean. Let, let me share with you what it means. I don't know. <laughs> okay? I don't know. I believe 
It has to do with the triune nature of God. I believe that because we are body, soul, and spirit. Okay? Body, soul, and spirit. I believe that's what God is speaking about. Okay? But I'm willing to be wrong. And I'm not going to tell somebody else that talks about the representative nature of man and how man has the ability to commune with God and that separates him from the rest and that's, and that's why he's made in God's likeness because, you know, porcupines don't commune with God. How do you know? How do you know? Because it says the very rocks will cry out. And if the rocks have an understanding of who God is, why does the porcupine not? It says all of creation groans. If creation has that understanding, how do we know what they can and can't do? I don't want to waste my time with that. Look, ultimately, when it says he created us in his likeness, I don't understand what that means, but I accept it. Imago Dei, the image of God. That's Latin. You guys just learned a fancy term, Imago Dei. It means that we were created in his image. To me, it's easier to say we're created in his image. Okay, because people don't look at me like, what? Okay. We were created in God's image, in his likeness. Of all of creation, we are the only one that this tells us was created in his image. All right. Now, uh, just, just so you know, when Jesus was born and, and lived on the earth, I, I really don't believe that he came and what he looks like in heaven prior to that point. Okay? Because... We see in the Old Testament, when Jesus revealed himself in the Old Testament, we see the splendor that caused people to fall on their face before him. Nobody was falling on their face before him just by the way he looked. As a matter of fact, it said he looked like a root. Nothing about him would attract us to him. He was plain old, plain old. Plain old, plain old. Okay? Now, being glorified, we know he was different. How do we know he's different? Well, because when he came back after raising from the dead, they didn't recognize him. I mean, think about it. Two of them walked all afternoon with him and then sat down and talked with him and he explained things to them and they're like, yeah, yeah, man, you got to go. Ding! <gasps> it was him. The ones that saw him didn't recognize him. There was something different. Boy, I'm, that gives me a lot of pleasure. To know that I don't have to spend eternity with this. Okay? So, we are created in the image of God, Imago Dei. And then God set man about his tasks. He said, you will have dominion over the earth. Take charge of it. Husband it. You understand what that means? What God is entrusting into man's care? Everything. Everything that he had created up to that point. He says, I'm putting you in charge of all of this. Take care of it. God, that is the first example of stewardship that we have right there. Now, was any of it man's? Did God say, I give you ownership? No. It, it's still God's. still belongs to him. He's just putting Adam in charge of it to take care of it. All right? So, we see that we are created in the image of God. We see we are given a task. And at the end of the day, what does God say? Very good. Very good. Now, he's looking at all of creation. And I think he's not speaking specifically about man. I don't think man was really all that impressive to God. I mean, when you're God, what's going to impress you? But he looks at all of creation... And man is now in the place that God, in his thoughts, had designed it to be. And he looked at it and said, yeah, this is very good. Everything is where it's supposed to be. And at that point, I'd be looking for the snake to kill him. <laughs> but God didn't. Because God's a lot smarter than I am. Okay? So, here we are. We have Adam in the garden. God says it's not good for him to be alone, so I will create for him a suitable helper. That porcupine, all he does is spend his day thinking about me. He's not going to help Adam. He needs a suitable helper. So he creates a woman. He 
creates heat. And things were good, right? <laughs> things are good. So Adam and Eve, having the nature of God, having the image being created in the image of God. You know, you know one thing that I read online? Adam and Eve were the only ones created in the image of God because they didn't have belly buttons. <laughs> Who's this guy? Okay. I understand they didn't need belly buttons, but how do you know they didn't have them? And why would that... <laughs> That's when you close, and you set it down, and you go play pickup or something, because it's going to be more productive. OK? So the image of God, whatever that looked like in the garden. But then what happens? Here we get into trouble, OK? Sin comes in. Now. God put the tree in the garden. Why? why? Why was the tree there? Why? So the man would have a choice. He would have a choice. He would have a choice. He gave them one command. One command. God did not have to do that. Do you understand that? God could have taken care of all of this by not putting the tree in there and not having to give any command. You think we'd have made it? No, I think we'd have still blown it. No commands to break, and we find one to break. <laughs> but the tree was there. And what's interesting is the serpent was there as well. Okay. So not only was the tree there, but the serpent was there. Why was the serpent there? Why did God allow that? You ever wonder about that? Do you ever even think about that? Why was the serpent there? Do you know what the difference is between testing and temptation? Do, do you know what the difference is? I'll tell you very simply. It's the outcome. One is put into place to grow you, to strengthen you, to build you up. The other is put into place to tear you down and separate you. Okay? Now, I believe that God had the serpent there as a test. That's why, that's the whole thing. I mean, God, God's God. He didn't have to allow Satan any room to do anything. But he did. Why? Why? God, why would you do this? I think it's so that he could demonstrate his love for us. Because ultimately, in all of this, all of this points to the cross. All of this points back to the cross. Interesting that it was a tree fruit, huh? Interesting. So the serpent comes in, and he talks to the woman. Now, guys, don't get all cocky. Don't get all cocky. Because what was Adam supposed to be doing? Looking after all of creation, including Eve. Okay? So let's just say, for the moment, that Adam was out pruning something. I don't believe so, because in some translations, the way that it reads, Adam was standing right there with her. I think he was there. But let's just say he wasn't. Eve falls. Hey, did God really say that? Well... Well, but you take it, God knows that if you eat of this, you're going to be just like him. Boy, do we ever see that today? And she falls. Now, you will notice in the New Testament that her falling did not condemn mankind. Right? You understand that? It wasn't Eve falling that condemned mankind. It was Adam falling. Now, Adam comes home. do 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 had a good day with the porcupine, babe. Sweetie, look what I made you for dinner. Great. 
Hey, that kind of looks like the fruit off of that tree. Yup. Okay. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you sometimes we're stupid. I think it's the Adamic curse that we're stupid. Because sometimes, instead of setting God as first in our heart and choosing to be obedient to him, we choose the convenience of no struggles with our life. Sometimes we choose peace in the home instead of peace in eternity. I think that's why Jesus says, if you love your husband or wife more than me, you are not worthy of me. Okay? You understand that? If we love God first, he's going to work everything else out. Don't worry about it. But Adam, was he concerned about God at that moment? No. No, he was not. And sin came in, and man fell. Now, we have, from here, oh, excuse me, i got to turn a page over. From here, all the way up, almost there, getting there, to here, all dealing with the repercussions of that failure. Okay? Do you, you see that? All of that is the story of everything that came out of that failure. And man has fallen. And man has separated himself for eternity from God. Okay? We have offended God. Now, we all have the sin nature in us. Okay? Quite honestly, Scripture makes it clear. We're born that way. We're born that way. Now don't, don't get all freaked out because I'm, I'm going to, this is how it comes up to this point. All right. Now God saw fit to make a way. First Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 5 makes it very clear. God saw fit to make a way. How did he make a way? By sending his son who became sin for us. He became sin for us that we might become what? righteousness of God in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that astounds me. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the righteousness of God in Christ today because that's next week. That's redemption. But we have a sin nature. What does that mean? Okay, let, let me clarify for those of you that are going, okay, point of theology. I'm talking about pre-cross, okay, prior to the cross, okay. We have a sin nature. That sin nature means that one, and it's twofold. One, we all have the propensity to sin. So I'm going to change that word propensity and just say we sin. Because it's not like we choose. We just do. Going back to those Ten Commandments, remember? Don't commit adultery. Jesus took that one and made it even harder. Because then he starts to reveal to us what sin really is. Sin is not the action. Sin is birthed in the heart. If you look lustfully, I tell you, you've already committed adultery. Because see, it's not the act that separates us from God. It's the nature. It's the heart. So we have this horrible propensity to sin, but we also have something else. Because see, from Adam on down, genetically... We're sinners. You don't have to teach a toddler to lie. They come by it natural-like. You don't have to teach them to be selfish. The first word they learn is mine. I can, watching my two grandsons, I was over in the, the two to four year old room one of the nights a couple months ago. And they're on separate sides of the room and they're playing with their individual toys. Their contentment reigned. Papa was happy. Everybody was playing quietly. <laughs> and Titus decided his toy was no longer content worthy. <laughs> but oh, what Judah had. And Judah, being so very content with his toy, had not reached the point of discontent yet. It was coming, but he had not reached it yet. And Titus walks up. <laughs> and 
And Papa walks up. No. Give that back to him. Go play with your toy and be content. Oh, did he give me the ugly. <laughs> oh. And Papa learned very quickly how much like his father. <laughs> and Titus learned very quickly what his father learned very quickly about Papa. Papa don't take that. <laughs> no, oh buddy. <coughs> and I gave him a whop on the thigh and he turned around and glared at me. And I started to ask him, what is your name? Come out of my child. <laughs> and boy, he got a whop. I mean, he got a little one for taking the toy away. But boy, man, when he got upright and Papa's face, he got a smack on the rear end, and he, he, was, he was not pleased. He was not well pleased with Papa for about 36 seconds. <laughs> and then he decided he wanted to make things right and wanted to come sit on my lap. Now that's one of the things that I have learned about God. When he disciplines us, it's always that we can return to our right place with him. Amen. Right? Our right place with him. But you know what? Christopher did not sit Titus down and teach him how to be a little... <laughs> Sinner. <laughs> you don't have to teach them that. They get it. It's natural. It's the nature. Okay? Folks, we have to understand this. The nature of what we are Or the cross, the nature of what we are is abhorrent to God. It is so abhorrent, He cannot allow it in His presence. He rejects it utterly. He is perfect, He is holy, He is righteous, and He cannot take that in His presence. You have to understand that is the relative position of man before God. We are in desperate need of redemption. Now, do you know what it means to be redeemed? Do you understand what that even means? It's a slave term. Okay? It's property. Okay? When, when you are redeemed, you are bought out of slavery. Okay? You are taken from this owner and you are redeemed. You're taken away from him. Now, right now, it's very simple. Without God, you are a slave to sin. You can't not sin without God. You're a slave to it. You're a slave to it. Your, your very nature, it's interwoven with you. And by that very nature, God rejects you. He can't accept you. Because he is perfectly just. And so we deserve death. We deserve it. Now, yeah, Adam kicked it off. But quite honestly, if you had been in the garden, it'd be your name that we would be griping at. You know? Instead of Adam and Eve, Glenn and Christy. Because we wouldn't have chosen any other way. We would have fallen too. Okay? So we have to grasp firmly just what we are before the cross. Because if you don't have a firm grasp on that, you will never appreciate the cross. And you will never, I really don't believe that you will ever really understand salvation. As a matter of fact, if you don't fully understand, if you don't grasp in some measure what you were before the cross, I don't think you really can come to the cross because you don't see the need for it. You know, God's not into walking around handing out fire insurance policies. That's not what this is all about. It's not just what you're avoiding. It's what is trying to be restored the right way. 
the right relationship, the way things were intended to be. I mean, think about the garden. God came in the cool of the evening to talk with Adam, to walk with him. I mean, how awesome is that? God desired that. God longed for that. And when that was broken, you don't think it hurt God? You think God, oh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I was just waiting. Quite honestly, I'm surprised it took this long. That, that was not his heart. I think God was shattered. His heart was broken because of Adam and Eve. Why? Because he knew it was already coming. And yet he did it anyway. I mean, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. That was his plan. I'm going to create them. I know they're going to break my heart. They're not just going to break my heart by running away willfully into sin, but by my very attempt to redeem them from that sin, they're going to put to death my son. So Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in communion decide we're going to do this anyway. We're going to do this anyway. We're going to allow mankind to break our hearts. And we're going to allow mankind to spit in the face of, of God. We're going to allow them to spit into our face that we might redeem them. Okay? So, right now, today we're laying out the problem. God created man and said it's very good. Creation is very good. Man fell. Man displaced himself from God. He removed himself from God's presence. He became abhorrent to God. God was not surprised. God was not defeated. God was not overthrown. God knew full well what was going on. The devil didn't pull anything over God. It wasn't like God got caught up in a bunco game and had no idea what the devil was doing. He was not surprised because he already had a plan in place. Why did it take so long? Why didn't he just send his son to die right then and there? Boom, boom, boom. He's got it. He could do anything. Why? I think he intentionally waited because he wanted man to see how very bad it was apart from him. To be able to appreciate what was being done for him. To be able to reach out for that lifeline. Going down for the third time, I have no oxygen left. And that big old floaty circle thing lands right by me. You think I'm not going to grab for it? But I tell you what, if I'm wading in water this deep and somebody throws me one of those, you think I need it? You guys are fooling yourself if you think you're wading in water. You're in over your heads. That's why the lifeline is there. Amen? Amen. Amen. So today we talked about the ugly. The ugly. The ugly is us. We have seen the ugly, and he was in the mirror staring back at me. <coughs> and you. Next week we talk about the beautiful. Next week we talk about the beautiful. So don't go away this week and not come back next week, because now you've got the problem. Next week we have the solution. Next week is redemption. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, that the story doesn't end with where we ended today. The story doesn't end with our separation. The story doesn't end with us being stuck in the sin nature. The story doesn't end with us being lost and going under for the third time. Father, I ask right now that you would help us to be cognizant of our desperate, desperate need for you. Father, to be aware of how great and glorious our salvation is. Help us, Father, to understand, to appreciate, to comprehend, to apprehend what this means, what it is. Father, that our hearts would rejoice that when we sing glory to God, we would sing it with everything in us because you are worthy of our glory, our praise, and our honor. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.